a great pleasure that I'm going to introduce the speaker for this evening, Pat Fontaine, for this e for uh, talking about the life and times of Edith Nurse Rogers and her husband, John. This lecture is being brought to you by Kurt, uh, with the courtesy of the Lexington Field and Garden Club and the hard work of its president, Ashley Rooney, and member Ruth Igo, club representative. I would also like to acknowledge George Gamada from the Historical Society, who's chief organizer of our commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I and his multifarious hubbers, and their organizations for a series of events that will culminate with a parade on November 11th, 2011. This 100th anniversary marks the end, marks the, the 100th anniversary of World War I. I'm honored to be the master of ceremonies of this evening and marshal of the parade because as the oldest member of my family, I'm representing and honoring my father, Converse, and my uncle, Stanley Hill. Both were veterans of World War I and were ambulance drivers in a unit from Dartmouth College for the first and then the American armies. Stan became the first young man to die from, to lose his life in Lexington. He lost his life to meningitis a month after he endured a shrapnel wound to his forest. He was bringing back wounded when his ambulance took a shell during the first stages of the decisive second battle of the Marne. He carried a camera, not a gun. And I think some of you probably seen some of the uh, uh, publicity for the, for the uh, whole celebration. And that's a picture of Stanley with his camera. John Jacobs and Edith Nurse Rogers' political life, and especially their support a veteran spanned a period of almost 50 years and two world wars. As a representative, a uh, Republican representative from the 5th District of Massachusetts, which includes Lexington. This evening's lecturer, Professor Patricia Fontaine, who has a strong academic background in history, is currently professor in the College of Education at UMass Lowell will speak about the Rogers' work on behalf of veterans and their welfare. Professor Vontaine has spent years researching the historical legacy of this amazing couple. And I asked her tonight, how's the book coming? Uh, she's been planning a book for years and years. She tells me it's out for publication. And it will be called The Angel of Veterans. To put our celebrations lecture tonight in some kind of historical perspective, John Jacob Roger Rogers was first elected representative to Congress from the 5th Middlesex in 1912, about the time that my father, Congress, and his brother, Stanley, graduated from Lexington High School. Upon John's death, Edith ran as a rep for her husband's seat. She started her tenure of 35 years as our representative in 1925, 18 days after I was born. I remember casting a vote for her in my youth and thereafter until she died while campaigning after 30 years of service in the United States Congress. Notably, she co-sponsored the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, the WACs, <clears throat> and the GI Bill in the 1940s. The latter allowed hundreds of GIs to go back to school, including my late husband, Norman Stoltz, a Navy vet who attended MIT, where I met him on a blind date in 1946. <laughs> Again, with great pleasure, Professor Fontaine. Well, Shirley's given all my speech already, so 
So thank you very much for having me um, here. I've been, I have this, been going on the road telling Edith a story because not too many people know about Edith, surprisingly. Even in Lowell, yes, because there's the Rogers School and there's her portrait at the Memorial Auditorium. But this younger generation definitely doesn't, and, and I definitely think we need to remember her. Her, knee, her name is really Edith Norse Rogers, but veterans called her Edith Nurse Rogers um, for, for a reason. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my journey with Edith. It's been about a 10-year journey um, because I love to research, but we also have to work. Um, but uh, I have, I've really collected a lot of testimonies, and this, uh, her story has really you know, touched a lot of people. Actually, she was the one with Tip O'Neill that set up the Lex your national park here in Lexington. So she uh, was very involved in not just in Lowell politics and in the everyday life of... Uh, of people um, in Lowell and in the area where she was a representative, but uh, of course her impact was national. When I was asked to talk about Edith, I said no. When I think of Edith, it's really World War II because of the GI Bill and other legislation she put forward. Um, but then uh, the more I thought about it, of course, her political thoughts, her social compass, her moral compass were all formed in World War I and her experiences in World War I. This is a traditional picture of Edith. She always had this beautiful gardenia. She also wore cotton throughout World War II because, of course, Lowell being the cotton city. And she was called the Cotton Queen. And then she had those, her, her shoes, which weren't very fashionable at the time. But of course, during World War II, the rationing, there only, you could only, there were only like six colors of shoes. So she made sure that she rationed everything she wore. But she was quite the lady. And I have some really good stories to tell you about her in the end and which we, we don't talk too much about because uh, <laughs> she was quite the feisty lady. And uh, she, and she need, you know, she deserves everything, all the accolades that she's received. So, Edith. Um, interestingly, she was really a, a blue blood Brahmin. Um, her, her ancestors actually came over on the Mayflower with um, Priscilla Mullins and John Alden. So quite the illustrious background. She was related to the Adams and the Boylstons of Boston. And she was also related to Rebecca Nurse, who was, and this is a quote from uh, John Whittier, Rebecca Nurse was one of the witches that died um, in Salem. So um, interestingly, she was 71 when she was put to death, Rebecca Nurse. And she was actually acquitted, and then the, the foreman of the jury said, no, no, you have to go back and rethink this, because she was a very pious woman. And Edith will, will talk a lot about Rebecca Nurse and, and her independent sp spirit, and to always tell the truth about you know, who she was and what she did. But she was, of course, burnt as a witch um, in, in, um, in Salem. So she has this illustrious background of somebody who, when you think about it, have, believing in veterans and advocating for veterans, and especially for the city of Lowell, weren't necessarily part, and especially for the middle class, weren't necessarily part of her background. Um, let me see if I can get this forward a little more. Okay. She grew up in Saco, Maine. If some of you remember, um, if you remember your history, Maine at one point was part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And Saco was just like Lowell. It was one of those towns in which there was lumber, um, there was definitely labor, had a lot of rivers, and therefore it was an industrial city just like Lowell. Um, especially known for its uh, nails, by 1850 was making almost 8,000 pounds of nails and selling it all over the, um, the country, um, and also known for its mills. Like Lowell, they were, they had, Lowell had the mill girls in the 1830s and the 1840s. Sacco had their own girls, but at one point they brought in French Canadians who actually just walked across the border and worked in, worked in Maine. And the Scottish-Irish, supposedly who brought the potato to Maine and uh, came in the 1850s. And so Sacco was a place that was just ripe for the Industrial Revolution as Lowell was. This is a picture of Edith that I found. Very young girl in one of those poster cards. Um, she was born in 1881. She had a young brother, um, Benjamin, and she was quite the apple of her father's eye and quite influenced by her father. 
This is her father, Franklin Norse. So he was a mill agent in Saco, and um, what was very interesting about him, he was a very benevolent overseer of the mills. He respected a 10-hour workday. He also um, opened a school for any of the, the uh, workers' children under the age of the 15. When they went on strike, he actually observed the strike and um, found money for a relief fund for his workers. So he was very, very, very well loved by his workers. The other thing he did was for the first time, and this was very unusual in the mills, he lived outside of the mill complex. A lot of the mill owners lived inside the mill complex. He actually lived on Main Street in Sacco in a house that still exists today. And he really influenced, um, um, I guess, the sense of equality and the sense of fairness that, um, uh, uh, that Edith had throughout her life. He moved to Lowell in 1895, and he ended up working also as an agent in one of the largest mills of Lowell, the Lawrence Mills. This is Lowell in 1895. Um, there's going to be, of course, one of the reasons that Lowell was able to bring the cotton, in, uh, cotton from the south and spin it in its own mills was because of the railroad. There was the Boston Lowell Railroad, which is the upper right um, f uh, picture here. And this is what, kind of what Lowell looked. So it was quite, it, it wasn't a provincial town, it was a quite large town. And, Lowell, and Edith moved to Lowell, and moving to Lowell, she moved in one of the, the most elegant streets of Lowell, in the Andover Street, and, and it was impossible for her not to know and not to meet her, 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 her husband, John Jacob Rogers, because they, they were in the same, actually, same social circles, and this is where she did meet her future husband. She had a governess, she went to the Rogers School in Lowell, which was a girls' preparatory school, which had nothing to do with her husband. She spent time in France as a preparatory, so she was quite the debutante and looking for a husband at this time. <laughs> so this is John Jacob Rogers, he's to the right. Um, 1881 to 1925, he goes to Harvard, he becomes a lawyer, he comes back to, um, to Lowell and he works with his brother-in-law, the Dunbars, who's still in Lowell. Um, but he also was involved in the community, like a lot of the Brahmin per se, he wanted to give back to his city. He was in Lowell, part of the Lowell Textile School, um, he was on the board there of trustees, he was on the school committee, and he decided to run for Congress in 1913. What is really interesting about John Jacob Rogers is that he went to Harvard at the same time as FDR. So they knew each other. And Edith used this when she became a legislature, this close, very close connection. So this is interesting. I was able to find Roosevelt's report card from Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets a C in history, <laughs> a C minus in government. Um, Latin, he got a B, then he got a C plus. He got, he was, he was in, you know, he wasn't a very good student. Um, I think his um, rank was like 959 or something, you can see it. So he wasn't a very good student, unlike John Jacob, who, who was an excellent student. But, uh, so they knew each other. They were in the same social circles, as I said, again, but he wasn't somebody who was, you know, very great, a very good student. Um, John Jacob got A in history and government. So John Jacob is elected to Congress from Lowell in the 5th District. In the 5th District, it was interesting during that time, it was really half Republican and half Democrat. So the vote could go either way. And what was extraordinary about, about Edith, even during FDR's tenure and during the New Deal, she, she won every election, every election. And she was the oldest, um, well, really the longest representative until about two years ago when a, rep a woman representative from Maryland ended up beating her, but uh, up to about five, about five, I think five years ago, she was the longest serving representative, woman representative in the House of Representatives. So he goes to Congress, and he right away, um, he, and he decides to join the army in 1918. Because he was a congressman, he, under the Manpower Act, he could have, been deferred, and he was. They said, "No, no, no. You know, if you're a member of Congress, definitely not. You don't have to." Um, he was. He didn't have to go into the army, but he didn't put his name as legislature on the application. He put it as lawyer because he really wanted to go into the army. And then by the time he enlisted, wanted to enlist in the army, the, the war was almost over. 
But in Congress, and one of his first acts was actually to reimburse um, G, well, not really GIs, but veterans during the time who were on furlough, they still had to pay for their own medical, they still had to pay for their expenses going back and forth from camp. So this is one of the acts that he wanted to, he wanted to make sure that um, was, was passed, and it was passed. But his, his real fame is the Rogers Act of 1924, and there's a gentleman here who talked to me about, um, oh, Mr. Bruin, I remember, from the Bruins, yes, whose father was part of the Foreign Service, and he's the one who actually established the Foreign Service. So during this time, there were consulates, and there were other you know, organizations within the Department of State, but there wasn't one strong arm of the Department of State. So he's the, actually the one who created the Foreign Service, and with creating the Foreign Service, what he also did was create the Foreign Service exam. So it was an exam on merit, you had to pass it. So he wanted to make sure there wasn't any nepotism per se um, you know, in, in the government. So that's really something which was a very strong, um, you know, something that he definitely wanted to make sure that passed and was passed. The other thing, so I'll talk about Edith and all this. So we don't know how political Edith was, but people who knew Edith realized that she had quite the influence on her husband like every good woman does, right? So, uh, so in 1918, she goes, she goes off for a fact-finding mission to Europe and the Americans are still fighting. Her boat that she takes is actually attacked by a U-2 boat. It wasn't destroyed and she ends up in, in London. And so that's going to be here, you know, her, her really where she wants to, to, to be. And she decides to work in a hospital. She's not a nurse, but she knows she can help, help out. She works from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And she writes a lot about this. So she really sees um, the effects of war, you know, right away. So in the hospital, I, I've been trying to find pictures of her during that time, and I, and I can't, but this is a picture of a lot of volunteers, and what she saw in London, which is gonna be her other mission, mission a lot of contract workers, not nurses, because nurses during the time were part of the American army, but other women who came out and helped um, in the war effort. And she realized that these women weren't compensated at all and weren't protected by any laws, unlike the, their British counterparts. So this, she, she always had this, you know, this in, her, in her brain, she just kept these experiences. And then later on, hoping that at one point she could either influence her husband or on her own do something. So this is a picture of the London hospitals. The next picture is kind of of my my France World War One. Um, I I was telling this story to my students, and they actually asked me how old I was in World War One. Then I realized. <laughs> Then I realized, that, and these are history te future history teachers, so I realized they have no concept of time. And I said, I wasn't even born in World War II, but I can talk a little about World War I. And of course, when I started teaching, what I do is prepare future history teachers. Um, I, don't, I didn't want to embarrass them, but now I have no problem embarrassing saying <laughs> things like that's probably one of the stupidest things I ever heard. But anyways, um, time is, and I, and I really worry about this generation. When I started teaching history at the university back in 86, um, Vietnam was still something our students could, you know, relate to. They either, you know, their parents fought in Vietnam. And then I, I thought the other day, I was talking about 9-11. When you think of that, okay, I mean, that's 17 years ago, and my students are 21, 22. They were so young, and so it's really, you really need that time reference point, and I worry that, you know, they're losing... They're losing any, any type of point of reference from their parents or the grandparents to talk about the past. Because in my family, we talked about the past all the time. So my grandfather is French, and he, he um, ended up in the first Battle of the Marne, and um, he, was, he was bayoneted, and so he was sent back to Paris. He was a policeman in Paris. He was sent back to Paris, and then he ended up the war being a policeman in Paris. And so we're talking, I can't imagine being bayoneted, but he said, what you have to remember, there was this one battalion of German, uh, German um, officers, because the, there was a high rate of death on officers, and I think unlike in future battles, where it was especially just your enlisted. But there was this one battle of elite officers, and in the bayonets, they had little hooks. So when they stabbed him, they would also you know, hook on some, something like his intestines, and he lost about half his intestines. 
And, but they sewed him up and they sent him back um, to Paris where he, you know, he recovered and then became a policeman in Paris. So, very interesting. Um, I've spent, I've been like, I'd say at least 12 times for the battlefields in Normandy in World War II. This is my closer connection. About two years ago, I said, I have to really visit the World War I battlefield. So some of these, some of these are pictures that I took, um, or at least a museum in Meaux, which is outside of Paris, was a phenomenal World War I museum. And then this is an ossuary, um, this in Douaumont, which there are 30,000 bones. Um, which you can see, it's, it's a used cathedral with these just, you know, um, these plates of glass and you can look inside. So the man on the left is called the Gulkassi, which is the broken faces. So when you think about it, this is an error, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, somebody here from Fort Devens, um, about, you know, at what, what were the medical advances during this time. During World War I, so many people died. We think Tom, Thomas Keene, who wrote a book on World War I, thought that in one battle of the Somme, almost one third of the um, officers died just because they, did, they couldn't get medical attention. But the one thing they did learn in World War I was plastic surgery and became quite the advanced stage. So this Gulkasse, he actually, there was, a whole, there was a whole hospital of plastic surgery. They also started to use x-rays and they also began bone grafts on these soldiers. Because when you think about it, if a soldier by the end of, by 1918, you really had this trench warfare. So soldiers would come out of the trenches, they would have their helmets on, and any explosions of shells, the first, or if they were crawling in this no man's land, what was going to be hit first was the face. So almost 15,000 of, um, of these French soldiers were, were of this condition, but the, quite the advances when it came to prosthetics, which Edith is going to remember, especially when he's talk, she's, she's thinking of the disabled veterans, and she saw, she went to France and went to the battlefields and, and did meet some of these girls cassé, and she actually saw the ravages of the war. I think one thing you have to remember about World War I, very different than World War II, it was very much a rural war. It happened in the countryside. So if you go to the, ba the, the battlefields of Normandy, I mean, other than the battlefield per se, or if you go to the cemeteries, the, the, there were many, many destroyed villages, but it wasn't an urban war. Uh, it, it was an urban war, sorry. It wasn't a rural war like it was in World War I. You go into the eastern part of France and you just see trenches and trenches and, the, and, and just these huge, huge craters all over and these martyred villages which they never, never rebuilt because they wanted to remind you. And I remember years ago when I was young, um, my parents, they, they, they took us to every horror place. They wanted real me to remember about war, right? So I remember going to Verdun, which was one of the, the worst battles, and, and, and remembering, and I was really, really young, but, but looking at, these, at these, great, these great fields, and I said, but nothing is growing in the fields, because the fields were so gassed in World War I, it took decades and decades and decades before things would even grow, and some, in some fields, nothing ever grew again. So the, the, really the scars of World War I are in the era of Eastern France. And of course, you have all that psychosis. Because there's one thing you have to remember about the French. They say that there was a Franco-Prussian War in 1870, which some of the French call, this is the first Reich tour. World War I was the second Reich tour, and World War II was the third Reich tour, and the Germans were coming again. So in, um, in the 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, the Germans actually came into Paris. And the French government left. And um, this is when, if you've ever been to Montmartre, this is when there was a big battle of the, um, the people of Montmartre trying to save Montmartre from the Prussians that were coming in. And the Germans actually, it was during the Franco-Prussian War, they stayed in France for three, three years, occupied it, until the French paid back with the, 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 these reparations, the same reparations which the French are going to give the Germans in World War I, because it's all about payback. It's all about pay, payback between the Germans and the French. And, and the other thing which is really interesting is that when the Prussians came into to Paris, they also had some Russian soldiers because Prussia is one of those odd man lands where part of it belonged even belonged to Russia, part of it belonged to Germany. And when the Russian, when the Russian um, soldiers were in French cafes, they would say, Bouistre, Bouistre, which is, which is quick, quick, quick in Russian, ended up becoming Bistro. And that's how they got the name of Bistro. So Bouistre, Bouistre. The Taxi of the Marne, of course, which, I, you know, we, we really can't equate it to 
the, um, the ships in Dunkirk in World War II, but they did save France in many ways. Um, the beginning of World War I was actually a mobile war, right? Troops were moving, everybody was moving. And the Taxi of the Marne, what they did was they left Paris. There were 10,000 taxis in Paris um, before World War I. 7, 000, then by the time World War I came, there were only 3,000 left because all the taxi drivers ended up being part of World War I. And they, what they did is that this is how they delivered troops because they really thought Paris was going to be invaded. So they, did, they um, delivered troops to the Marne Valley to protect Paris because it's not that far from Paris. So the Taxi of the Marne is part of that myth of saving Paris and the unity. So once again, it was saved from the Germans until 20 years later. Um, the other thing is, of course, these martyred cities. I mean, there's some cities, they just don't exist anymore, which has become a real problem to the older generation when they're trying to say, well, I was born in this city, or my grandparents, my parents were born in this city, and that city doesn't even exist on the registers anymore, completely ob obliterated. This is, a, this is a great view from the sky of what the land looks in. So you can see the potholes, which are these craters, and the trenches. Because the trenches actually are going to go from really from the Swiss border all the way to the North Sea. It really, I mean, the, it scarred the landscape to the point that it was unrecognizable. Okay? Then, of course, 20 years later, we're, we're going to be fighting, but in a different part of France. So that's kind of my connection. So um, Edith goes to to um, London, goes to France, does her fact-finding tour. She just wants to see, and she really wants to see the, what the veteran has to say about war and the services that, that they're getting. So she decides to go to the Walter Reed Hospital, and she volunteers one more time, and she's, a great, in the, she's called a gray lady just because of her uniforms. But she spends a lot of time there. And John Jacob and, and Edith, what they do is that they're quite the socialites. They have a lot of money because John Jacob's family, his mother was part of the Lowell Mills. They were in the Lowell Mill, Mills. They were flathers. So they have a lot of money and they entertain. And the rite of the passage for any junior legislature was to go to the New Year's Eve party at the Rogers, which they did. And Edith, of course, continued this tradition. Her first calling are be veterans, veterans of all time. Um, and it, it is, so she sees the veterans on the field. She sees the veterans in France. She sees them in, um, in London. But she also, and she also sees them in Walter Reed. So all the veterans, and even today, her legacy are the post 9-11 veterans. Because everything she did from the GI Bill all the way to, nine, to, to now, when at the UMass Lowell, we have, a, we have a very strong, rigorous, and robust Veterans Affairs Bureau. This is all because this is all because of um, Edith. Korean War, of course, they're going to update. This is a statue in Washington D.C. of the monument. She's going to um, she's going they're going to update the, the the GI Bill and of course the landing in Normandy. So she is the woman of the time when it comes to the veterans. So here she is. So you see Edith with a funky little hat there on the, in the right, the only woman, she's many times as the only woman with a lot of men. And she really sees her mission as to taking care of veterans as a moral obligation to our family. She really sees the veterans as her family. And even the veterans, and I interviewed some veterans who remembered her, they're very, very old. Um, they'll say, you know, she just was like my mother. And I have a lot of her letters that people wrote her and it's always Dear Edith. It's dot, never Dear Congresswoman, it's always Dear Edith. And that's what she wanted to be called. This is really interesting. I, I don't know if you can, I don't think you can read this, but this is a letter, these are two letters by Coolidge, President Coolidge and President Harding that said for one dollar a year, they're going to hire Edith to be hit their fact finders. And what they wanted was to Edith to go and talk to the veterans and find out you know, the, the opinion of the veterans about the care coming back. The VA was something that was created way, way after World War I, even after World War II. But this is something that she really wanted. Um, was, and she's actually the one who established the Veterans Administration. And then after that, it's going to become a, a cabinet post way after, many, many years after her death. 
So for one dollar, this is what she decided to do. So she roamed all the hospitals where the veterans were coming in from, and she especially went to Camp Devons, which we're going to talk about. So she was called the best soldier, the the soldier's best friend, and this is something that she'll be remembered for, and of course everybody will know her for. She also becomes the godmother of Devons. So there is a Rogers, I think it's a Rogers Way in Devons, which has nothing to do with Edith. I think it has to do with her husband, but. Um, she connected with Devons right away. She went there during the World War I years, and you have to remember that it was called Camp Devons back in World War I. It was, it was one of the 16 cantonments in, um, in the United States, and it was a processing place for veterans who were either going out to battle or coming back, going overseas or coming back. So it was a very, very important camp. And it was swiftly and quickly um, you know, built in World War I, some 1,500 buildings actually um, were on the, on the site per se. And she made sure that uh, she was smart. She knew that Camp Devons could bring a lot to this area here. So she, in, when she finally becomes into, um, she becomes a legislature, she changes the name. She makes camp into Fort Devons. And not only was that good for veterans, so they would be leaving and they'd be training in, in Devons, but it was also good for the economy of the 5th District. And so she, was, she wanted to make sure that always looking at the economy, always looking at how it can help her district when it comes to financially, but also how it can help the men and women who are going to be in the army. So she, was, uh, she never forgot who she was representing. This is another um, picture of her with some elite officers putting on a medal. And this is Fort Devons, just a little bit about Fort Devons, um, well, Camp Devons and Fort Devons, and I won't go on too much into this. But it's especially, it was especially known for um, receiving veterans during World War I. Unfortunately, it was also especially known for the Spanish influenza. And we know that one third of the world population was killed during the Spanish influenza. Now, do not think that the Spanish influenza was in Spain, because it wasn't, because Spain was neutral, as it always has been. It was called the Spanish influenza because it was probably the only country that reported on the ravages of what was happening in Europe. The American press didn't want to re report on, the, on this influenza because they, didn't, they wanted to make sure that the morale was going to be high and they didn't want to sap the morale, so they really didn't want the people to know, unfortunately. So Devons was part of what is called the second wave of influenza from September to December of 1918. And this is when the ma majority of the uh, veterans who were there died. You're talking about 1,000 veterans will die. Um, and part of it is because we didn't know anything about viruses back then. Okay? We didn't know anything about how it worked, this, um, this influenza, which is called, of course, the flu. Back then, it was diagnosed as pneumonia. And of course, the idea of quarantine, so at one point they said, we have to start quarantining, and, and then we did start quarantining. But um, it did take some time before they realized what it was and recognizing it as a virus. But Devons is, is really known for being the one area around here that was hit very, very hard by the Spanish influenza or the flu. It's another picture of, it, of, the, of the camp. Quite a lot, I think, bigger than it was now, but. So this is Edith. So um, what's really interesting about Edith is that we're saying, well, how could this woman have this, you know, this illustrious political career? Did she have any training? Well, she did. One, because she listened to her husband. She went to a lot of the sessions in Congress. In 1924, she actually became an elector for the state of Massachusetts. Her husband was going to be, was elected as elector, but he couldn't because he was in the legislature. So she already had some rudiments of a political education. What's interesting about her and about many, many other women was that they were called, she, she, I guess we can say that she accepted what was called the widow's mandate, all right? So this was an illustrious club of women who had grew up in the progressive area, era and decided to take on their husband's voice and the hu husband's mandate. Now the men who were controlling, you know, the whole government, they just thought, okay, nice Edith, you know, your husband says this, we want you to follow, you know, his footsteps and don't say too much and you, maybe you don't want to run again. And Edith says, absolutely not. She said, when she was campaigning, and she, one thing she said, she says, I don't, want, I don't want people to think, I don't want them to vote for me because I'm a woman or I'm not a woman. Being a woman is irrelevant in this campaign. She does say that she was a Republican by conviction, and her heart was Republican. 
And her first official act, which was really interesting, is that she was always known as Mr. Jo Mrs. John Jacobs Rogers. When she was elected, she decided to change her name to Mrs. Edith Norse Rogers. So she was separating herself from her husband, except you know, she did follow with his campaign for veterans, but she made sure that her voice was, was um, heard. So this is her campaign poster, all in black. You have to remember that she won campaigns and nobody, nobody ran against her. Just a story. So in 1949, there was this, this woman um, who was, in, was really angry at, at Edith who accused her of having her, an affair with her husband who was like 30 years younger than Edith and happened to, ha and happened to be on her staff. And, which was great, but it was all thrown out because it was, it, it was Edith. But I actually found the second wife of this aide. He was a, he was a captain in the Navy. I went up to, to Portland, Maine, and I found this woman. And her husband had passed. And actually, this man was the executor of Edith's will with a lot of money. But I don't know what happened there, but anyways. Um, but what she told me, and she told me, and it was and it was verified by one of Edith's nephews, was she wanted to run against John Kennedy when he ran for the Senate in 1960. She died, of course, in 1960, but she wanted to run, and and, and I think she would have won. But she, at one point, she tells this this aide who tells the second wife that she was afraid that uh, Kennedy's father would kill her, um, that he would go. <laughs> And maybe he would have. I don't know if Joe Kennedy would have done that, but she said, oh, no, no, I don't know about those Kennedys. I'm really afraid that you know, he, might, he might kill me. And so therefore, I decided not to run. I don't know, but at that point, maybe you know, she, was, she was really getting old, but uh, she was considering it. But the, the other thing, her second calling was really for women in the military. And she remembered, again, what she saw in London. And she saw all these women in, in World War I in London. So th th this is not the nursing corps. There was an army nursing corps, but, women had, but the women who were contracted, who were actually civilians who would work in the army for some, you know, clerical, um, for some clerical um, jobs, weren't receiving any benefits. Navy, they did. And the only reason the women got in the Navy was there was a Navy Act of 1916, and it said something about males or any other persons who can help out. Well, then women, seeing any other persons who can help out, they joined the Navy and they didn't see active combat, but at least they had the status and they had all, every single benefit that they, in the Navy had. Not, the, not, in the Navy, not in the Army, though. But what Pershing really needed in the Expeditionary Fort were the Hello Girls, who were the telephone operators. This is the first war where men on the field or commanders on the field could actually contact the headquarters and the command headquarters. Pershing was in a, in a place called Chaumont, France. They had the wires, he, he, and he actually thought that men couldn't do the tedious work that women do, so therefore he wanted, he wanted telephone operators from only from the Bell Telephone Company to go over and to work, and they did, and they were called the Hello Girls, because they always said hello, and they continued on, right? Um, but unfortunately, when they came back, they wanted to come back with honorable discharge and get some benefits, maybe some pensions, but of course they, they, they couldn't because they weren't part of the army per se. The other thing about the communication, so I don't know if, if we still do this in schools now, but we used to have those IQ tests. I know when I was growing up, we all had IQ tests and our parents would be appalled by our lack of IQ or something or, or, or really amazed that we had such high IQs. But one of the reasons that the Binet test, the IQ, came about was because of World War I. What we know is that there were so many men um, who fought in World War I who were illiterate, and so many men died because they couldn't read the orders. So after that, when the, when the IQ test came around in 1925, that was part of the reason, just recognizing some of the issues with, um, with, with veterans or with soldiers per se. These are the hello girls. So what did Edith learn? What, he lear what she learned when she finally came to office, and this is, this is fast forward, was she formed the WACs. 
Now, this, these were auxiliary. This was, and this was really tough for her to get through, to get through Congress. But we know that we wanted women to replace men in some of those arduous menial jobs, right? So um, she, she put forward the, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps by 1941. It was a big compromise. Men really didn't want women to be in the Army. Um, and it was, it had, they had some benefits. But they didn't have the benefits of insurance, uh, life insurance. They didn't have the benefits that they had been captured overseas, and and you know if they'd been taken to a prisoner of war camp or whatever, um, they wouldn't be protected under the Geneva Convention. But this was this is the first step in giving equality, and for the wax to become the wax. So about 150,000 wax by 1941. And then, of course, this turned into what's going to be the WAX, which is the Women Army Corps later on by 19, by 19, I think 1943. And these were the women were part of the army, but still not really. But they found themselves um, all over, all over the, um, all over the globe. Um, after the Normandy beach, the Normandy invasion, a lot of them went over to um, Eisenhower wanted them to go into the European. Uh, the European theater. They also, surprisingly and ironically, they also recruited the Naisai, which is going to be the second generation Japanese American women who they had interned in camps like five years before to go to Tokyo. Um, so they also went over as translators. So the women did an enormous, enormous job. What was really interesting, the, the WAX, the WACS, who were here in the United States, they gave them less, less rations than, than men because they thought they weren't as muscularly built and they didn't need to have as much food as, as men. But these, this was an enormous force um, in all the air areas of the Navy, the um, Marines, and of course um, in the Army. Um, they won't be part of the, really integrated till 1978. They were always a separate part of the Army. Up to 1971, if you were pregnant in the wax, you were dismissed. So it wasn't until 1978 they really were recognized for who they were and what they could do. Of course, the third calling was Lowell. I won't do very much about this, but the Depression ended when the war began in Lowell. Lowell was always a, a cotton mills, but there was the Depression, the real Depression, and Lowell really never did survive. But women were always in the workforce. When we talk about Rosie the Riveter, it's kind of really uh, a misconception because women were always working in World War I and war factories, and about 20% of women always worked in the factories. But I love this quote. It says, working wives have been the rule rather than the exception in Lowell for a long time. No draft was uh, needed to get them in the factories. So um, it looks like the feminine contingent is saving the bacon as well as cooking it whenever it can buy it. So, and um, I don't know, you know, if any of you can remember Lowell during World War, um, during the factories at least. I mean, GE was in Lowell. They had, um, so therefore they, they had rockets that were built in Lowell. Atlantic Parachute Company was in Lowell. They had an ordnance company. They were building shells in Lowell. Um, one out of two sailors wore uniforms that were made in Lowell. Corduary ro uh, robes for all the army were made in Lowell. The John P Joseph Pilling Company that made shoes, they had great contracts and every, there was 100% war effort in Lowell. The war ended and that ended Lowell, so in many ways. Her fourth colony w uh, calling was gonna be the unknown soldier. This is, I don't think people re know too much about this story, but it's, it's, it's really a fascinating story. Um, one is the bonus army, um, also was the quote, which I said, the unknown soldier, not at Arlington, but forgotten at Matacumbe Bay. The bonus army, um, I, I, I don't know, you know I, I think it's a story that should be told and told more. It really was an issue of national colonists for fairness. The problem, so these, these veterans were coming out of World War I, they weren't given their pay. Um, we know that in World War I that if they paid out um, what was due for these veterans and pensions for veterans would have sapped the economy, the GNP, by 43%. In World War I, we were still paying benefits for Civil War dependents, not the wives, but also the children. So they would go that far back. So there wasn't any money. Hoover and FDR, they said, we just can't set the, set the economy. We have to get out of this depression. We just can't pay these veterans. So of course, there was this march on Washington. And it was called the Bonus Army. What was interesting, that the people who were there with bayonets and rifles were George Patton, 
who is quite the SOB in many ways, but that's a whole other thing. I mean, I, I really respect him. I actually went to Luxembourg this last summer to go on his tomb, but he really, Ike was there, you know, Patton was there, Ike was there. And it, it, it was, it was, it was oh, I can't imagine these, these veterans facing, you know, the, that, the soldiers of that day. Um, but they, they didn't get their due, all right? And um, so what happens is, some, is the, well, before that, I'll talk about this man, Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. So Teddy Roosevelt is gonna lose his son, Quentin, in World War I, and Theodore Roosevelt was the other, um, the other son, and what was really interesting that he was actually the one who started the American Legion. With, he had this conversation with his Sergeant Patterson, and he said, we should start a Veterans Association, and they did, and then it was this Henry Colmery who was going to put it in, put it up, make this organization and actually going to, who's going to pen the uh, GI Bill. Um, Theodore Roosevelt is a really interesting character. He landed on the beaches of Normandy with his soldiers and, and it really, I mean, Patton said, you just don't do that. You know, you send your soldiers and you go later. He was very, very popular. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack um, on, <clears throat> in the Normandy beaches. This is actually his grave um, in, in the, one of the um, cemeteries, the main cemeteries of, of Normandy. Um, but he was also advocated right away for veterans. So this is the Forgotten Men, the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. I was listening to the news and what's been hitting uh, Florida. Well, this is a Category 5 hurricane that hit, hit the, key, the Keys, Key West, in 1935. It was going to be a tropical storm um, and ended up being a Category 5. What, what happened was that um, the Key West was during the... During the the end of the, I guess the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was a paradise. It was one of the, in the area, it was one of the richest cities in, um, in the United States. They, they ran rum, which brought a lot of money in. Uh, they had cigars, were uh, rolling companies there. And also 80% of the world's supply of sponges were, ke were coming from Key West. The depression comes and then now you only have 12,000 people in Key West and we're earning maybe, we're getting only about $7 a month to survive. FDR sees, well, this is an opportunity because he was a man of opportunity. And he says to one of his men, he says, why don't we make Key West into the Bermuda of America? He contacts, contacts a man called Henry Flagger, who had a lot of money, and Henry says, all right, I don't want to stay in New England anymore because it's too cold. I want, to, I want to have a railway and bridges between Miami and the Keys. And, this, and FDR agrees, so they decide to build these bridges, this bridges between the key, all the Keys. So what do they do? What does FDR, do? What, does she, what does he do? He sends, all, he sends bonus army veterans to the Keys to build these bridges. Edith is appalled, because for Edith, this means, we have all our transcripts, this means he wants to get rid of these men. This is his way of dealing with them. So they go to the Keys, and um, unfortunately, um, a hurricane strikes. They should have, by the time they knew that the men were stuck there, the trains couldn't arrive from Miami and clear them out. There, four, there were 406 dead um, veterans, about 265 missing and, and a lot of unknown. It completely, completely destroyed the Keys, and it was horrible. So for, for, for months and months and months, they couldn't even get into the Keys. Ernest Hemingway, he had, a, he had this yacht down there because he lived in Key West. He did a lot to try to recover some bodies, but by this time, with the heat of the, of the Labor Day, it was very hot. They just couldn't identify any bodies. A lot of the men were buried in mass graves, which either said absolutely not, and a lot of those, those were ba buried in the cemetery of Matukum, Matukumbe or in our International Cemetery. She was, she was livid because the, the report that came out from a Senator Rankins of Mississippi, who she's gonna meet again in the GI Bill, who didn't like her at all, didn't at all, um, and he said, because the report was, it was an act of God. This is what happened, it just was an act of God. And Edith said, absolutely not. Anything that deals with veterans is not an act of God. So it says she was exactly the type of woman likely to annoy Rankin, who was a Southern Democrat, an articulate, sophisticated, uppity Yankee female from Massachusetts who was a Republican to boost. Not at all like Rankin, who was a Southern Democrat. And then her final call was the GI Bill of Rights in the VA. FDR, he remembered what happened to the Bonus Army, and what was ironic was actually 
Edith voted against the Bonus Army Bill to pay the veterans. Her greatest regret as a legislature, but she actually thought in the Depression, it was, you know, we needed, the United States needed that money and not pay it out. And what FDR do, and I love this quote, that the, the GI Bill was similar to the spirit of the New Deal, that government could regulate and provide, but not do. Great quote. And so, of course, it's going to end up being the, the um, Servicemen's Adjustment Act of 1944. It almost wasn't passed. It was, well, a lot of it had to do with, some of this, with Rankin, who is um, one of the chief members on the committee, very anti-Semitic. Um, in the history of a lot of the Ivy League colleges, um, Jews were not permitted into a lot of I Ivy League colleges before the GI Bill. Rankin did not want the GI Bill um, to be a colorblind legislation. He did not want to give the same benefits to, to, to African Americans and to whites, so it was a very acrimonious. And it ended up that one legislator from the South, we needed his vote, he was sick, he went home, they provided a, plan, a plane for him to come back to, to Washington to vote, and of course it was passed. Definitely colorblind legislation for everybody. Not necessarily very favorable for women because they, there were no spousal benefits for women because the spouse was always the woman, right? So when a man stayed home with the children, there weren't necessarily any spousal benefits. But as all of us know, it really changed. It made America a knowledge society. It, um, these men who were going into the classrooms with all these young undergrads with beanies on their head who had all these experience of landing on, on the beaches of Normandy, and they ended up getting the highest GPAs for years and years and years. So um, it, was quite the, it was quite the legislation which we can't forget about and which still is very much in existence today. And um, this is Edith, you can see looking at prosthetics. She had seen what happened to the uh, GIs in France, wanted to make sure it didn't happen. So she made sure that she provided prosthetics under VA, that, they are, that the VA was going to be a place where all GIs could go to and receive these, um, these services, as well as cars, adapted cars, which also was something that she really voted for and was able to pass legislation. Almost 70% of her legislation went for, was for about veterans. This is her in back of uh, FDR signing the GI Bill, which of course she's gonna be so thrilled about. Some really great pictures of her. And this is her actually on the Capitol steps um, and she's signing this bill. The one thing she wanted to do was also set up VA hospitals. And of course there's the Rogers, Edith North Rogers Hospital in Bedford, the Bedford VA. And uh, she wanted to make sure, because at one point the VA was, who was one, who was going to take part of the educational, who was going to um, make sure that all the GIs got their educational benefits. At one point it was going to be the Department of Education, which thank God they didn't vote on, so now it, is, it was actually the VA. She made sure that the best surgeons, the best doctors actually were employed by the VA. And VA hospitals, for all we talk about, it does, they do have excellent reputations when it comes to medical care. Um, she wanted the VA to be a part of the um, a cabinet position. It wasn't. It was going to be a lot later on. But she wanted to make sure, again, that uh, everybody who served, that they weren't going to be forgotten, which is going to be very important. And she made the point, and as did FDR, that the difference between veterans and those specialty groups or special interest groups who want certain rights is it's... Those special interest groups, they want special rights because who they are, but for veterans, it's for what they did. And that is so important. That, and she will always want to remember that for what they did. And testimonial, I'll just read this to you. This is by Representative Morse, who took her place in Congress. But closest to her heart were the men and women who had served in defense of the Republic when it was threatened by the aggressive designs of those who would destroy men's freedom. Her selfishness in behalf of those who were disabled in the nation's service, of the widows and orphans of those who served, were given in the defense of our country. In fact, in behalf of all citizens who are privileged to defend our American heritage in time of war is known to Americans everywhere. And that really was, you know, the, the, best, the best eulogy that could have um, been given for, for Edith. She did a lot more. She actually, there was a Rogers-Wagner bill. She tried to um, open our immigration doors to Jewish children during World War II and it was voted down by Congress. Um, she was the first, first person in Congress to stand up against Hitler, and she got many, many death threats because of that. So she, was, she, was, she wanted to open for international mail service. She, she made sure that the international, there was international air, inter, 
well, air service between the United States and that was one of her legislation in Latin America and South America back in the 30s. So she did a lot for this country, but especially to the veterans. So my last, my last slide is my favorite, which is nothing, uh, is this. So these are my parents. And my father, so my father was this American GI who ends up, uh, he landed on Omaha Beach ended up getting, going to Paris, and, and with the liberation of Paris, he went to a dance and he met his beautiful French bi bride, which is my mother on the right. Unfortunately, he was a 100% disabled veteran, so um, he, he had talked about Edith, and you know, uh, Edith died in 1960, and you know, I, I didn't know Edith at all, but um, he kept on talking about this woman, this woman, and I never really made the connection between veterans, and I used to go see my father at the VA, because many years later he still was receiving services and operations in Manchester, New Hampshire. And when I finally got to Lowell, I said, everything is Rogers here, everything is Rogers here, and I finally made the connection between between Edith and what he had done, what she had helped my father, even though he was in New Hampshire and outside of the Fifth District. So, um, so this is what it's all about. I mean, all of you are going to be, you know, you're celebrating November 11th, 1918, um, the end of, you know, the end of the war, and we all know it was, you know, the 11th hour, the 11th month um, of, um, of 1918. But my, my father, he was an Italian, he, he was born in the United States, but his father was an, an Italian immigrant who, his, and he came here in 1910, and he tried desperately to get into the army. He really wanted to, and there are a lot of immigrants who wanted to get into the army in World War I, but he wasn't able to do it, so my father really felt that you know, it was up to him to, um, to carry that torch. And my father was quite old. There was 10 years difference between my father and mother by the time um, he, was, he enlisted. So that's my story, that's Edith's story, and uh, any questions? Okay, moving mic. My question was, uh, did Edith and Eleanor have any interactions? Yes. Um, Edith calls her relationship with the Roosevelt's, uh, they, they, had a, they were on a twitting basis. The one that she reports, at one point, um, FDR, um, he, the, and he delivers a speech, maybe it was the State of the Union address um, in Congress, and, he, and Eleanor sends out this note to all the legislatures that she would really appreciate it if everybody would stand up and clap when her husband gave a speech. Edith sends back this note, says, that's not what a democracy is about. If that means that we have to clap every time a leader shows up and makes a speech, that's tyranny. And oh yeah, she really, she really had problems with the, with the Roosevelt's. She, so yeah, she, she didn't mince any, any, any of her words um, when it came to the Roosevelt's, even though they really, you know, they the same social you know, circles. And she said in one of her letters, she says, I'm so tired every time that I go see I, I, I go see Franklin, you know, and I open the door and he sees me and he says, oh, Edith, it's you again. So I think he knew that there was something else that she was going to come and ask him. Because during those times, I think that's what she did. She just actually showed up in the White House and said, I want to talk to Franklin. A little different than now. Any other questions? No? So hopefully you learned a lot about Edith, a lot about veterans. And I just want to tell you that th this is a real hoot that I'm here. I do come to Lexington a lot because of your fabulous restaurants. But I taught 10 years in Paris. And uh, when I came back, I actually got a job teaching French at the Estabrook School here. <laughs> and my, I don't know if any of you knew, my good friend was Bill Terrace. I don't know if any of you knew Bill, who was a... Yeah, he just passed away last year. And uh, so I really enjoyed, you know, teaching French in the elementary line. And I always, then after that, I started teaching, you know, full-time at the university. But um, I, I really appreciate that, you know, you are doing the celebration. We have to remember the celebration. And that, um, you know, you remember the veterans. That's what, that's what we have to do. Thank you.